Appendix 3 Abortion Among the earliest battle lines between the early Christians and the Roman Empire was a matter of abortion. Greek and Roman laws had at times forbidden abortion, even as they had also permitted it. The matter was regarded by these pagan cultures as a question of state policy. If the state wanted births, abortion was a crime against the state. If the state had no desire for the birth of certain children, abortion was either permissible or even required. Because the state represented ultimate order, morality was what the state decreed. To abort or not to abort was thus a question of politics, not of God's law. Plato, for example, held that the state could compel abortion where unapproved parents proceeded without the approval of the state. Very early, the Christians accused the heathen of murder, holding that abortion is a violation of God's law. Thou shalt not murder. It was also a violation of the law of Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 to 25, which held that even accidental abortion was a criminal offence. If a woman with child were accidentally aborted, but no harm followed to either mother or child, even then a fine was mandatory. If the fetus died, then the death penalty was mandatory. Because the law of the Roman Empire did not regard abortion as a crime, the early church imposed a life sentence as a substitute, penance for life, to indicate that it was a capital offence. The Council of Ancre, 314 AD, while making note of this earlier practice, limited the penance to ten years. There were often reversions to the earlier severity, and for a time, in later years, the administration of any draft for purposes of causing an abortion were punishable by death. The Greek and Roman influence tended to weaken the Christian stand by sophisticating the question by trying to establish when the child or fetus could be considered a living soul. The biblical law does not raise such questions. At any point, abortion requires the death penalty. Incidentally, the old question as to whether the fetus is, quote, a living soul, end quote, has been given an answer by research, according to William P. O'Connell, who declares, Many feel that the choice is the woman's. I would agree if it were clear that the fetus is part of the woman and thus hers to dispose of. The evidence, however, is to the contrary. Microbiology has established that the zygote is human and an autonomous, if dependent, organism from conception. Once fertilized, the cell is no longer latent life. It has its full and human allotment of chromosomes. It is uniquely human, like no other living thing or part of a thing, anywhere along the evolutionary chain. Los Altos Town Crier, Wednesday, April 22, 1970, page 1. The Didache, an early Christian document, called all abortion murder and a love of death, whereas Christians are called to a love of God and of life. Wisdom declared of old, All they that hate me love death. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 36 Here is an important key to the problem of abortion. We shall return to it later. The debate and discussion of the subject of abortion is very extensive today, quite academic and unrelated to reality. Thus, the American Medical News, June 8, 1970, page 7, has an article by Dr. Charles A. Defoe, M.D., entitled Thoughtful Action Needed to Find Middle Ground in Abortion. Dr. Defoe is an obstetrician gynecologist in Denver and chairman of the Therapeutic Abortion Committee of the Presbyterian Medical Center there. Dr. Defoe wants a, quote, middle ground, end quote, between a total ban on abortion and total permissiveness. Is this possible? Is there a middle ground between murder and the protection of life, between adultery and chastity? The reality of the situation has been reported to me by two doctors, as well as by other persons. Supposedly, therapeutic abortions are permitted only after approval by a psychiatrist or two psychiatrists and a review by a board of doctors. In reality, in those states where abortion can be authorised, psychiatrists often sign their requests without bothering to see or interview the applicants and the review boards are not consulted. One doctor on a review board, but never consulted, 
stated that he walked into his hospital one morning to learn that ten abortions had already been performed. His hospital performs very few abortions as compared to others. University and county hospitals are often chief offenders and are becoming, quote, abortion mills, end quote. Some religious hospitals perform a large number of abortions also. The invention of suction machines, which are quite cheap, have made mass abortions a reality. According to Governor Reagan of California, under the mental health section of the new law in California, Our public health department has told us its projections that if the present rate of increase continues in California, a year from now there will be more abortions than there will be live births in the state, and a great proportion of them will be financed by Medi-Cal. He said, under a technicality, a young unmarried girl can become pregnant, go on welfare, and she is automatically eligible for abortion if she wants it, under Medi-Cal. And all she has to do is to get a psychiatrist, and they're finding that easy to do, who will walk by the bed and say she has suicidal tendencies. Reagan said that in Sacramento, a 15-year-old girl has just had her third abortion, with the same psychiatrist each time saying she has suicidal tendencies. I don't think the state should be in that kind of business. Reagan sees abortions topping births, Santa Ana, California, the register, Friday, morning, April 24th, 1970, page D5. According to the American Medical News for May 25th, 1970, the Board of Trustees of the American Medical Association has urged a, quote, new abortion policy to prevent the decision to be made by the woman and her physician, end quote. This is a return to paganism to the belief that no sovereign and transcendental God governs man and the universe. It is a pagan belief that the control of life is essentially and finally in the hands of man, or of man's agency, the state. This total control of life by human agencies is a part of the plan of the predestination of man by man. Predestination is an inescapable concept. If we deny that God predestines, we will assert ultimately that man or the state predestines. Whether belief in God's predestination declines, planning or predestination by the state rapidly takes its place. There is no lack of belief in predestination today, but it is belief in status predestination, in planning and control by status agencies. We should not be surprised, therefore, at a report from Paris of a UNESCO meeting on the problems of aggressiveness. A U.S. scientist told an international scientific meeting here Tuesday that therapeutic abortions might prevent future Hitlers from being born. Dr. David A. Hamburg of the Psychiatry Department of the Stanford University Medical School told a meeting that research had linked the presence in mothers of abnormally high amounts of testosterone, the male sex hormone, with aggressiveness in their children. While there was not enough knowledge at present to apply these findings practically, Hamburg foresaw that decades from now, a doctor and his patient might choose a therapeutic abortion to prevent the birth of an extremely aggressive individual. The UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, where the meeting was held, mentioned a future Hitler or a Genghis Khan as people who might be eliminated in this way. Abortions held way to avoid tyrants, Los Angeles Times, Wednesday, May 20th, 1970, Part 1, page 9. It is clear that abortions are, first of all, an attempt by man to play God. The widespread approval of abortions by churches reveals that these churches are anti-Christian and are, in fact, humanistic churches. When man plays God, he seeks first of all to control life, to grant or to take life on his own terms rather than God's. God, as the creator of all things, has given mankind his law and scripture, whereby we are to govern all things under God. Not man's, but God's will is the concern of God's law. It is precisely this power which humanism grasps at by law, to take or to spare life in terms of its own decree. Does God require capital punishment for certain offences? Very well then, the humanist will deny the validity of capital punishment for these offences. Does the Bible deny the, quote, right, end quote, to abortion? 
then the humanist will establish a quote, right end quote, to abortion on his own terms and execute capital punishment on the fetus. Not surprisingly, there is an increase in assassinations and in murder. Men resort to their own will and their own plan and set aside God's law, which is God's declared plan. They seek to control life apart from God. Man has made himself the arbiter and God of life, and he decides quite readily, in terms of his own logic, who shall live. Thus, in Colorado, the question of euthanasia, so-called mercy killings, was put to a vote by the Colorado Nursing Association. Voting in favour of euthanasia were 173 nurses, only 109 against it, and 55 abstained. A clear majority favoured mercy killings. What was most significant in Colorado was that the debate on the question made the difference. Before the debate, where arguments were offered for euthanasia, only a third of the nurses favoured the idea. After hearing arguments in favour, a majority voted for what only a third had accepted before. Eliminating the Old, Twin Circle, June 14th, 1970, page 6. More significant than the vote was the attitude of these nurses that euthanasia is an open question, one for man to decide or to vote upon. Today they vote in favour of killing the aged and the infirm. Will they vote to kill doctors tomorrow? Or will the doctors vote to kill all nurses? If men can decide who shall live, whom will they kill? Unwanted children can be aborted, the aged put to sleep, all priests and ministers killed, all communists, Nazis or conservatives executed, the Jews sentenced to death or the Germans eliminated, all blacks wiped out or all whites. All of these are open questions if man can decide who shall live. All of these have become open questions as humanism has developed in the 20th century. Either God's law prevails or man's law. If man's law is accepted, Everything is an open question. When man plays God, man himself is the victim. Under God, the doctor is a minister of life, of healing. His profession has had a long and necessary connection with a priestly calling. Under humanism and with abortion, the doctor ceases to be a healer and a protector of life and becomes a murderer. Statute law may permit abortion, but it is still murder, not only under God's law, but under common law, as doctors may sometime find out. Under the influence of humanism, a radical change is taking place in the medical profession. Instead of being a man who regards life as sacrosanct, as wholly governed by God, and beyond his province to destroy, the doctor is playing God in most cases. But because the doctor is not God, he becomes a murderer. The majority of people may favour abortion, but they will not respect an abortionist. Even those pagan cultures which practice abortion freely despise the abortionist. Man, created in God's image, will, even when fallen, reflect to some degree the judgment and law of God. With the increase of abortion, the medical profession will rapidly decline in prestige. As a hated and despised group of murderers, even the women who use them will welcome the total control of doctors by the state. Few will wish them well. Second, as we have noted, abortion represents a hatred of life. This hatred of life manifests itself in a number of ways, from outright suicide to suicidal activities. It is estimated that 250,000 will commit suicide in the 1970s and another 2 million will try and fail. 250,000 US suicides predicted during 70s, Los Angeles Times, Sunday, June 7th, 1970, Section A, page 21. The use of drugs represents a form of suicide and a hatred of life. Arden Jones of the University of California has stated that in the US, over 100,000 young people, 2.5 times US war deaths in Vietnam, have been killed by drugs and far more have been converted into mental cripples. Drug Tool, Twin Circle, May 17th, 1970, page 12. A wide variety of suicidal activities are common today. 
the hatred of God is also the hatred of life. In his novel, Death of Ivan Illich, Tolstoy tells the story of the death of Ivan Illich, a conscientious official, but a man without faith. As his fatal illness progresses, he begins to hate all people in good health. He hates his wife and children for being so strong, clean and healthy. With all the loathing of a diseased body for all cool, white, sweet-smelling flesh. Henri Troya, Tolstoy, page 559. Tolstoy's Ivan Illich can serve as a symbol of humanistic man and his culture. As it faces death, humanism turns on life with hatred. It pursues a suicidal course of action in every realm and strikes at life with savage and murderous intent. It professes to reverence and affirm life, even as it murders it. The drive for legalized abortion is a worldwide manifestation of this hatred of life. Pompously, the legal and medical authorities write in various restrictions on abortion, even as they approve it. All is supposedly wisely governed and therapeutic. But, in actual practice, the decision is a thumbs down on life. Abort? No restrictions in actual practice. Their love of death and hatred of life manifests itself in an increasing abortion rate. With some girls and women, it has become a kind of status symbol of, quote, liberation, end quote, to have secured an abortion. They have proven their freedom from God and their dedication to ecology to preventing a supposed overpopulation. On every level, it is a mark of a dying culture, a hatred of life and a desire to play God. Indeed, all they that hate God love death, and death shall be their destiny. But we are called to life. This has been a Calcedon Foundation production, produced by Grace Community School and Nicene Covenant Church, published by Ross House Books. Copyright 1969, 1974, 1975, Mark R. Rushdeny. If you enjoyed this audiobook, be sure to visit calcedon.edu for more books and audiobooks by R.J. Rushdeny.